Right. Good morning, everybody. We are very busy this morning. I am so excited for this talk because a lot of you have been asking questions about menopause, and I'm so happy to have Dr. Rebecca with us this morning. Hi, Dr. Rebecca. How are you? Hi, Susan. Really well. It's great to be here. Thank you. What? So this is the structure, ladies. For you, for those of you who have uh, come um, with the Expat Living Talks before, please remember to mute yourself so that we can clearly hear Dr. Rebecca this morning. And also, if you have any questions, pop it in the chat. And then I will read it out loud for Dr. Rebecca after she's finished her presentation. Um, so I'm going to continue admitting everyone. Um, Dr. Rebecca, if you just briefly introduce yourself and also introduce our poll, then we'll start our poll after oh, you. Lovely. Good morning, everyone. Well, I am delighted to be here today talking about the menopause as a woman, as a GP with a specialist interest in women's health. And this is a conversation we really need to be having right now. And as I'm looking, we're approaching 170 people. I mean, this is just fantastic. So we thought we'd start with a poll just to see who's sitting in our audience today and just get a better feel uh, of who's here. Okay. Let me launch it now for people. If you just take a couple of seconds to answer the questions. It looks like we are all in the same age, <laughs> between 45 and 50, 50 and 55. Everyone is not sure about their symptoms. I'm going to launch this and show you the result when everyone has done it. Right, so I'm going to end the poll now and show you. Can everybody see the results? Yes. Dr. Rebecca, can you see the results? Yes, I can. So that's interesting, isn't it? So the majority of women seem to be between 45 to 50. Um, 40% have had some menopausal symptoms, but actually a staggering 41% aren't sure, which is very interesting for me, actually. Um, and finally, do you talk about menopause with your friends and family? 18% no, so about one in five no. 42% um, yes, not bad actually. And then 40% sometimes. Okay, great, lovely. So we're gonna proceed with the talk then. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I'm gonna stop this one. So if you still can see the poll on your screen, just press the red button for it to disappear. Okay, great. All right, Dr. Rebecca, over to you. Great, so we'll just set up the presentation. Right, hopefully you can all see my presentation here. Um, so I, as I say, I'm absolutely excited to be talking today about the menopause because this is a really rewarding condition to treat as a doctor because you can make a real impact on a woman's life at quite a crucial time of change. But it's important to remember that the menopause is not a disease. It is not a condition. It is a stage of your life. Yet for some women, it can be very distressing with quite bad symptoms. And the menopause has been shrouded with myths for too long, actually. And there's been lots of negative press about potential treatments. So today, I'm hoping to demystify the menopause for you. I've done all the reading, the guidelines, I've read all the research. So I'm gonna summarize all that information. So when it's your time, you can make an informed decision about your care. 
Now, interestingly, when I was asked to do this talk, I heard of a big celebrity called Davina McCall in the UK who decided to do a primetime documentary on the menopause and talk about her experience and interview experts. And I was really excited that this was happening, but I was quite disappointed to hear at the time her producers told her, oh, I don't think it's a good idea. Don't go ahead with it. It's about aging. It's a little bit unsavory, um, but she pushed on anyway. And the response has been phenomenal. She has been, or the programme has been inundated by women saying, this is me. I'm fed up of feeling like this. Thankfully, someone's now talking about it. And I've been chatting with colleagues back in the UK, and they are also being inundated with women wanting to talk about HRT, wanting to talk about menopause options for treatment, um, which is good. The conversation has now started. It's not going back in the box. Um, so hopefully today I'm going to try and demystify some of um, these points. So this is a summary of what we are going to be doing. So um, this is the overview. And first of all, I'll be talking about what is the menopause? So how do you know if you are having menopausal symptoms? How is it diagnosed? Um, what, how, how, what would a doctor do to tell you that you're going through the menopause? I'll be touching on the long-term um, effects of the menopause. Um, so after your period of stop, what happens next? And particularly focusing on your heart health and your bone health. I'll be giving you some information about how to keep well during the menopause and beyond. And then we'll move on to HRT, those three letters that have caused so much controversy. And I'll give you all the up to date facts on the pros and cons so that you can make the right decision for you. We'll have a, a, a section on sex and contraception and how the menopause impacts on this. We'll talk about the impact of the menopause on your lifestyle, on your work. And finally, we will be talking about how to get the most out of your GP. And I'll give you all my top tips because sadly we are still failing many women in this area. So we, before we move on, I thought I'd just challenge you on what your ideas are, um, your preconceived thoughts on the menopause. So we'll go through these statements and just in your mind, think about whether you believe this to be true or false. And then at the end, we'll pop back to it and see, it'd be interesting, has, has your thoughts changed? So the first one is, you know it's the menopause when you have hot flushes. HRT is the leading cause of breast cancer. Antidepressants should be used first for women with anxiety or depression during the menopause. The menopause only lasts one or two years, so you should just put up with it. Weight gain during the menopause is inevitable. Your sex life is over after the menopause. So let's see, we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so why is this an important topic? Well, interestingly, 50% of women between the age of 45 to 65 who were having menopausal symptoms in the last year did not consult their doctor about their menopause symptoms. So what's going on? Is everyone just sailing through? Well, no, they're not. Women report on average seven menopausal symptoms. 42% of women felt that their menopausal symptoms were worse or much worse than they expected. Half of women said their menopause was impacting their home life. A third said it impacted their social life. And half of women said it was impacting their sex life. So clearly, we do need to prioritise the diagnosis and management of the menopause in primary care. We have failed women for too long. Now, don't forget, women are now living longer than ever. Back in the Victorian time, the life expectancy of a woman was 59. So it's only just over 100 years ago. And their menopause happened a bit later. It was about the age of 56. So they only endured it for two or three years before they died. But now women are living in the developed world on average to the age of 83, which means you are spending a third of your life in the menopause. That's a third of your life in a state of hormone deficiency. 
we are also now having this sandwich generation. Women are busy with their careers, they're looking after their children, their teenagers, our own parents are living longer and have more health problems and we're looking after them, even if it's from afar. And the role of women has changed over the years. We are now living in a more highly functional society. We work later, we re retire later, we're more active. But isn't it a shame that we're still not really talking about the menopause? We're not chatting with our friends about it. And maybe it's because we feel we're past it if we're menopausal. There's this stigma about the menopause. And I find this interesting because I think any woman that's had a baby will know that after a baby, you will talk to anyone and everyone that will listen about the birth story. And it's a great thing to do. It's very cathartic. It's been a, a good support and it's about all being in it together. But when it comes to the menopause, we don't tend to do this. And there's also this outdated thought that the menopause, you should just push on and get through it and it will go away. But women are now suffering in silence with their symptoms. And we're not talking about these long-term health risks, even after your symptoms might have settled. So we need to get the conversation going. We need to raise awareness. You don't have to endure your symptoms. So let's start with, well, what exactly is the menopause? Now, the name menopause comes from the Greek term meno, which is for your periods, and pause, meaning stop. So the menopause is when you have not had a period for 12 months, for a year. But the time leading up to that diagnosis, your hormones are starting to change and you can develop symptoms in the run up to the menopause. Postmenopausal is then the period for the rest of your life after the menopause. So you see this period of time in the postmenopause as an estrogen deficient state. Your estrogen is not coming back to a good level at this point. So here you can see the premenopause into the perimenopause where there's huge fluctuations in hormones and then the menopause when you've not had a period for 12 months. So let's talk about what is actually happening with your hormones. Well, all women, as you know, we have ovaries. They're about the size of a strawberry in our pelvis. And their job is to release an egg every month, which is ovulation. And if you don't get pregnant, then two weeks later, you have a period. But the other big role of the ovaries is to produce hormones. And it's three main hormones they produce, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And we have receptors throughout our whole body that are activated by these three hormones. They affect your brain, your bones, your heart, your arteries, your joints and your ligaments. They affect your periods, your menstrual cycle. The progesterone supports your pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester. And they affect your sex drive, your mood, your well-being. The list goes on. Now, during the perimenopause, if you remember from that graph before, what's happening is your ovarian egg reserve is in decline. So we are born with millions of eggs and these gradually decline over time. And what happens then is your hormones fluctuate and become quite erratic and progesterone falls off first and then the estrogen goes up and down and up and down in a downward trend and testosterone for some women can fall too and often that fluctuation is what gives some of the symptoms such as mood swings now there's different types of menopause most women will have a natural menopause um, but there is such a thing as an induced menopause and this could be from surgery. So maybe you've had ovarian cancer or you've had a large cyst on the ovary and you've had to have your ovary removed. And I'm sure most of you will remember Angelina Jolie, who's a BRCA1 um, carrier. She has the high risk gene for ovarian and breast cancer and she had surgery to remove her ovaries. We also know that radiotherapy and chemotherapy can affect your ovaries. And thankfully, we're seeing more children survive now childhood cancers. But a consequence of their treatment as a child can be for some uh, earlier menopause. And then other women are put into menopause with certain drugs. And the commonest one is the GnRH analogs. And this is a drug used for endometriosis. But most women, it will be a natural menopause. 
So when will it happen? Well, the average age now of menopause is 51, but anywhere between 45 and 55 is quite normal. If your menopause starts under the age of 45, we would say it's early. And if it's under the age of 40, then it's called premature. And the newer term for that is premature ovarian insufficiency. This is surprisingly quite common. So one in a hundred women under 40 will have a premature menopause, one in a thousand under 30, and one in 10,000 under 20, which is very uh, a very distressing thing to have. You're more likely to have an earlier menopause if there's a family history. So 20 to 30% of women who have a premature menopause will have someone in the family who also had an early menopause. And you're also more likely to have this if there's a history of autoimmune disease. So if you suffer with things like celiac disease, diabetes, thyroid problems. So your age of menopause can be affected by your genetics, but also your smoking can bring on an early menopause and your BMI, your weight. Now, if you did have an early menopause, it is paramount that you do take HRT until at least 51. And there's no risk with that because all we're doing is giving you back the hormones that you would have had anyway. So let's talk about the symptoms because there are many, many symptoms of the menopause. Now, the first thing people always think about is your periods changing and your periods can become lighter. They can become heavier. Initially, they might be a little bit closer together and then gradually they get further and further apart so that you might be having a period just once every three, four, six months until eventually they stop for a year. And then we say, that's it. That's the menopause. Some people get worsening PMT symptoms around this time due to the fluctuation in the hormones or they may start to develop PMT for the first time. Now, hot flushes is often the joke of the menopause, but it's no joke if you suffer with it. And this is also another really well-recognized symptom of menopause that most people will think about. But for some people, they don't get hot flushes. They actually get sweats at night. And I've heard of women having to lie on towels because they're just dripping in sweat when they wake up the next day. And some women just get palpitations um, and they can end up being referred off to cardiologists and having lots of expensive tests and, and not realising this is part of your menopause. Your skin changes around the menopause and then that can cause dry itchiness of the skin. We lose the collagen in our skin and the skin becomes more dehydrated generally. Your hair changes, it becomes more coarse, and some women develop thinning of the hair, particularly at the top of the scalp in a sort of male pattern baldness way. Headaches can be really common around the perimenopause, and if you've been a migraine sufferer, often your headaches start to get really uh, much worse. There are effects on your sex life. Often women start to reduce in their libido and vaginal dryness can be a big problem, which can make the sex painful. Your bladder has receptors for estrogen and without as much estrogen, you can start to develop problems with incontinence or you need to go to the toilet more frequently, or you may start to get lots of urine infections and end up on lots of antibiotics. Your joints, your musculoskeletal system is affected. Restless legs can be really distressing. This is a sensation at night where you just can't feel comfortable in your legs and you have to just keep moving them. Weight gain is very common in the menopause and there's several reasons for this. Often we're a bit more sedentary. When you don't have as much estrogen, you also crave sugar, a bit like before your period when your estrogen level drops. Your sleep isn't as good, so you may not be exercising as much. But also, if your estrogen is dropping, your body actually starts to put weight on around your tummy because that fat tissue produces estrogen. So your body is trying to boost the estrogen, but it's a pretty rubbish estrogen that it produces. It's called estrone, and actually that can have some bad effects on your health. So joint pains, muscle aches. I've seen women being diagnosed with fibromyalgia and they've been off to um, rheumatology clinics. And again, no one stepped back and looked at the bigger picture. 
Lack of energy is a big one. Many people feel very tired all the time. And insomnia um, can be a real problem. Often women fall asleep okay, but they find that they're waking up in the night, um, and that could be several times a night, or they're waking up early in the morning and they can't get back to sleep. The psychological impact of the perimenopause and the menopause is huge, and this is often a reason why patients will come and see their doctor, actually. And I see a lot of anxiety at this time. Women that have never suffered with anxiety before are suddenly feeling on edge and fearful. They don't want to drive the car anymore, or suddenly they're fearful of flying concentration and a brain fog. You know, they find the car keys in the fridge and are wondering, how did that happen? They're not enjoying things quite so much. And the world seems a bit flat, a bit gray. Their zest has gone. And they just can't put their finger on it. They have difficulty making decisions. They're procrastinating a lot more. And often these mood swings with crying spells um, and sometimes real rage um, can happen. And generally a loss of confidence. And if you have previously suffered with bad PMT or you had bad postnatal depression, you can be a bit more susceptible to the psychological effects of the perimenopause. And it may come as no surprise to know the peak suicide rate in women is between 50 and 54, which coincides perfectly with the average age of menopause. The problem is that you might see your GP, particularly if you're not having hot flushes and it's mainly psychological consequences. And the knee jerk from the GP could to be, be to start you on antidepressants. The problem is antidepressants don't work for the effects of um, mood changes with the perimenopause because it's estrogen your body needs, not antidepressants. Now, don't get me wrong, when I'm not doing women's health, I really enjoy mental health too, and I prescribe a lot of antidepressants. But the doctor really needs to tease out, is this menopausal changes or is this a true mental health issue? And to be fair to doctors, it's quite difficult sometimes doing that, but there are certain things that we would look for to try and tease that out. And the list goes on with the symptoms of the menopause. I mean, dry eyes, um, so many uh, issues, tingling of the skin, a sensation of insects crawling under your skin can all be due to your lack of estrogen. Even with COVID, we're seeing that postmenopausal women who aren't on estrogen are actually having a worse time because we know that your immune system goes down after the perimenopause. So let's talk more now about hot flushes because often women are not quite sure if they're having hot flushes or not. And let's face it, we live in Singapore, it's really hot here. So I had one lady the other day saying, well, I get very hot, but so does my husband sometimes. So it is tricky. And I would say the hot flushes can start even before your last period. So again, going back to the point that you can develop symptoms before your periods have stopped. So it's due to this falling estrogen and estrogen um, is important for temper temperature regulation. Three out of every four women will have hot flushes and for about 80% it will last up to two years. And it does affect different ethnic groups differently. So as you can see, it's um, much more prevalent in European women and this would also apply to people from um, North America too. So, what is the characteristics of a hot flush? Well, it comes on suddenly, it can be any time of day, it could last just a minute or two, or it could go on for up to an hour. Some people feel dizzy or have palpitations and sweat. And as I mentioned before, it could just be at night and you're getting a uh, night sweat. So here's what's happening with the hot flush. Your core body temperature suddenly rises because of these hormonal fluctuations, your skin has this glow, your heart rate's going, um, you start sweating sometimes, and then it suddenly drops back down again, and some people actually get a bit of a chill afterwards. These are possible triggers for hot flushes and things that you should identify if that's affecting you, maybe um, withhold those things, so spicy food, hot drinks, caffeine, alcohol, often we drink a bit more to mask some of the symptoms of menopause, but it could be triggering your hot flushes. So will you get symptoms? Well, one in four women actually have no symptoms and they just breeze on through, 
the periods just stop, fantastic, great. But three in four women will have some symptoms and one in four women will describe their symptoms as severe. So how long will the symptoms go on for? Well, most women can expect their symptoms to go on for four years. And about one in 10, so 10% 10 of women, it will go on beyond 12 years. And the important thing to remember is that symptoms can vary with time. And this is often where the diagnosis can get missed because one minute you've had a hot flush for a few months, but then that settles. And actually now it's more vaginal dryness or your mood has gone or you can't sleep. Um, but then you go and see your doctor and they give you some uh, treatment for thrush and they talk about your mental health. But because you're not having hot flushes, they may not be saying that it's to do with um, your menopause. Um, so it's looking at your, your system as a whole. So how do we diagnose the menopause? So you've identified your symptoms, what next? Well, the important thing here is that the blood tests are really unreliable. Um, going back to, as I said before, in the perimenopause, your hormones are fluctuating. So we try and look at a hormone called FSH, but I could check your FSH today and it's normal. Um, and I could send you on your way and say, no, nothing to do with perimenopause. You know, let's, let's do some tests for why you're tired all the time. But I could get you back next week and check it. And then it could show that you're actually perimenopausal. So it isn't very reliable. So all guidelines, international guidelines, would now say that if you're over 45, if you have the symptoms of menopause, you do not need a blood test for diagnosis. So it is a clinical diagnosis. Now, there are some times when we do want to do hormones. So anyone who's having an early menopause, it is important to then check the FSH, although it may still be normal, um, but we do test it in that scenario. And often we do other blood tests as well for your symptoms if you're quite young having, having these symptoms. The LH is similar to the FSH, but it's even less reliable. And sometimes you can also look at your estradiol, your estrogen level, although again, this does fluctuate. So here you go, you've got the perimenopause when the symptoms start, you're then moving into your period stopping as the estrogen level is going down. And then when the estrogen level plateaus, you're in this postmenopausal state and that will be for the rest of your life, you'll be living with an estrogen deficiency. And that's when we start to see the long-term consequences of this estrogen deficiency. So I'm going to focus mainly on your bone health and heart health. So osteoporosis is a thinning of the bones which causes a fracture. And it's a bit like if you think of the chocolate bar, the crunchy, you know, it's, it's full of air, it's soft and you can snap it. And this is what is happening to your bones. Your bones are getting thin. And the problem with osteoporosis is it's a silent disease, a bit like having high blood pressure. You don't know you've got osteoporosis. It's slowly happening to you. You actually lose or can lose 20% of your bone density within five years of the menopause. I mean, that's just phenomenal. 20% of women after the age of 50 will get osteoporosis. So it's a big deal. And one in two women will have a fracture after the age of 50. So this is the consequence of osteoporosis. It's a risk of fractures. And when we're talking about those fractures, largely we're talking about vertebral fractures. So fractures in the spine. And what happens is the bone literally just crushes down. So you lose height and you, your spine will curve and you can have some terrible chronic pain from that fracture. And it's very difficult to treat a fractured vertebrae. The other big fracture that we worry about is a fracture of the hip. And it's more than just having a hip replacement. We know from many studies that people who've had a hip fracture generally do worse in life. And these statistics are quite shocking. But as you can see, after a hip fracture, after the age of 50, half of women will be permanently disabled. 20% of women will die. Now, they might not die because of the hip fracture, but there'll be a knock-on effect on their life. 30% require supportive care in some way. And that usually means that they need to be in a residential home or they need to be in a nursing home. 
only 30%, one in three, will actually recover from a hip fracture without any consequence whatsoever. So now let's talk about the effect of the menopause on your heart health. Now, women tend to develop heart disease much later than men, and that's because we know you have these estrogen receptors in your heart and in your arteries that are protecting you, and they're stopping the buildup of atheroma, blockage of, of the arteries. But as your estrogen declines, then this protective effect is lost. We also see a rise in your blood pressure, your bad cholesterol, the LDL starts to go up, and even your HDL starts to decline, that's your good cholesterol. It's, as we said before, it's more common to gain weight and because of your fatigue, you're generally could be more sedentary. But it's really important to know that heart disease is the biggest cause of death in women. 45% of you will die of heart problems. It's not breast cancer. Only 5% of women will die of breast cancer. So actually the heart is, is the bigger issue. So what can you do to keep well during the menopause? Well, that's actually quite a few things you can do. I mean, it's definitely a good idea to prioritize your sleep. And, and this can be a little bit easier said than done if you're having lots of night sweats or insomnia. But all the usual, what we call sleep hygiene measures. So avoid being on your phone late at night, avoid any sort of reading the news, particularly at the moment, or watching sort of a thriller late at night and trying to do something calming like meditation, mindfulness, reading, knitting, whatever it is that sort of calms you down at the end of the day, keeping a routine with your sleep, avoid exercise late at night, try and get the sunshine in the morning. All these things can help with your natural sleep rhythm. Diet is really important. I mean, as a doctor, we will always tell you what you eat is important for your health. But at this time, it becomes more crucial. And generally, we're talking about more of a low carb Mediterranean style diet because we know from studies this is the best for your heart. Gut health and hormones. I mean, I find this a fascinating part of medicine, and I think the future will be a lot about gut health. Um, and we are increasingly aware that having good bacteria in your bowel can help with the management of your hormones. And there's some evidence it also helps with mental health too. So this is taking probiotics to have the good bacteria in the bowel, but it's also eating lots of whole grain because that gives you the probiotic which is the fiber to allow the bacteria to grow on, to multiply in the bowel. Calcium is very important. I mean, a lot of us now don't have as much calcium because we're avoiding dairy for certain reasons, and that's fine, but it's important to make sure you are getting enough calcium for your bones. Actually, there's a really good calculator on the National Osteoporosis Foundation website where you can plug in what you're drinking, um, what you're eating with calcium, and it will tell you if you're getting enough. If you're not having a good sort of 700 to 1000 milligrams of calcium a day, then you should supplement yourself. But only supplement yourself if you're not getting enough because we know too much calcium is not good either. Everyone really in Singapore should be taking vitamin D. I see so many people who are low in vitamin D and you think, gosh, we're in a sunny place. How is that possible? But if you think about it, often we're putting on sun cream or we're inside in the air con. So top up your vitamin D, 1000 units a day. Magnesium can really help actually with, um, with night cramps, with sleep, with relaxation. Um, the only side effect, if you take too much, you can get a little bit of uh, diarrhea. Smoking and alcohol, sometimes we go more to our vices when we're, we're not having a great time, but these can trigger your hot flushes and obviously they're not great for your heart either. Exercise is really important. And we know that if you do sort of impact exercise, it will help your bone health. And by that, I mean walking, jogging, playing netball, whatever you enjoy, where there is impact going through your bones, because that will encourage the cells in your bone to put down more bone to strengthen it. Um, and the other important one is muscle mass, actually doing some weight training or resistance work, because as your testosterone drops, it is harder to maintain muscle mass. 
We know from studies that people who don't maintain their muscle mass have a, a lower longevity, actually. And obviously, cardiovascular benefits of the of exercise and it's very uplifting, get the natural uh, feel good hormones um, boosted in your brain. And don't forget, it's important to have some downtime and some stress management. It can be a really hectic time of your life, um, but just trying to, to factor that in where possible. So I often get asked about alternatives to HRT, and there are quite a few actually that you can consider. Now, I've already said that antidepressants won't help with the mood effects of the menopause if it's truly due to the menopause, because what your body wants is estrogen. However, we do use antidepressants for other reasons at the time of the menopause, and that can be hot flushes. Um, in the US, they've licensed paroxetine for hot flushes. Um, and we sometimes also use things like citalopram, sertraline, effexor. These are often quite useful for women who've had breast cancer and often are having bad hot flushes. And actually some of the treatment for breast cancer can even cause worsening hot flushes. Um, the problem with antidepressants is they have side effects. Um, so insomnia can be a big one with antidepressants. And while often that does improve, some people it doesn't. Um, and often you're already struggling with sleep. The other one is libido. I think it's about 40% of people on antidepressants have a reduction in their libido. So that may not be appealing for someone around the perimenopause. And then obviously things like nausea, stomach upsets. Clonidine is another one. Now I used to prescribe quite a bit of this. I must admit, I've not prescribed it for a while, but it is licensed for treating hot flushes. It's originally a blood pressure medication, um, but the problem with it is because you may not actually have a blood pressure problem, you can get side effects. So you might feel a bit dizzy on it. But I've had some success, I would say in the past with women who can't have any other options. Gabapentin, now this is an epilepsy medication, but as doctors, we do know that some medication can be used at different doses for other reasons um, off license. So it wasn't intended for that purpose, but we've seen benefits, so we do use it. And gabapentin is one of those drugs. It can help with sleep and hot flushes, but again, the side effects, often it's not greatly uh, well tolerated. CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you can do it yourself or, or maybe perhaps it's better to do it with a therapist. This is a type of therapy to understand your thought processes and what the resulting behavior is um, and how that impacts on you. So it can help with things like sleep or your negative perception of menopause and for some people they use it to help manage their fear of having hot flushes um, so that is a possibility but the studies show the benefits are generally short-lived about six to twelve months but that if you're through everything by that point that might be all you need Herbal medication. Now, often women have tried all of these by the time they come to see me in clinic, but there are options and you can get them without prescription. But I would warn you, I wouldn't say these are necessarily safer than medicines. Um, for example, black cohash can cause liver problems, as can St. John's wort. Red clover and phytoestrogens should not be taken if you've had breast cancer. Um, so there are possibilities here. There are interactions between these, these herbal um, supplements and medications. So St. John's Wort interacts with contraception, for example, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, but so there's some evidence they can help. I would say I've seen benefit, particularly with black cohash, for people who's on the milder end of the spectrum. Um, and if that's all they need, then, then that's great. They can try that. Yoga has some benefits. It can help with the joint stiffness that we often get around the menopause, helps with relaxation and sleep. Aromatherapy can be useful for similar reasons. And actually, I should have added acupuncture as well, because there is some evidence acupuncture can help with hot flushes and with sleep and stress management. And obviously, it's widely available in Singapore. So for women that are having more severe symptoms, so that's your one in four women reporting severe symptoms, they may need to have a discussion about HRT. So before I get onto all the controversy about HRT, let's just have a look at the benefits first of all. 
So first of all, we know that HRT will treat your symptoms. Your symptoms are due to an estrogen deficient state and we're giving you back the estrogen. It will reduce your risk of osteoporosis and fractures. In fact, international guidelines would say if you're under the age of 60, HRT should be used first line for osteoporosis. It reduces your cardiovascular risk if started early. You have this window of opportunity at the beginning of the perimenopause. If you start HRT within 10 years, you can halve your risk of heart disease. And remember, heart disease is the biggest killer in women. So this is not insignificant. We know that women who start um, HRT slightly later might be at slightly risk of heart disease, but we'll come on to that. We're starting to believe that it can reduce your risk of dementia. So after heart disease, the second biggest cause of death in women is dementia. And one um, in two women over the age of 80 will have dementia. More women get dementia than men because we're losing the estrogen, we're losing our hormones. We've done MRI scans of women after the menopause and you can literally see some shrinking of the brain. We also know Alzheimer's is caused from deposits of amyloid, a certain type of protein on the brain, and estrogen stops that process. So there's definite theory behind HRT preventing dementia. We know it reduces your risk of bowel cancer, just like the contraceptive pill does. It reduces your risk of diabetes. And studies show it actually reduces your all-cause mortality. What that means is death from all causes. There's a lower death rate in women who've taken HRT. So great, sign me up, sounds fantastic. I don't know what the fuss is about. So what has gone on here? Why are we worried about HRT? So I thought we'd just look and go back in time to really understand about the HRT story. So there was huge interest in the 20th century about HRT and Primarin was first introduced in the US in 1942. And this was from pregnant mare's urine, hence Primarin. Um, and this was a, not a great estrogen, it's quite a high dose and it used three different estrogens in the mix. But it was started there. It wasn't really used in Europe until the 1960s when Robert Wilson re released a very famous book called Feminine Forever and really proposed this concept of estrogen deficiency. And this was at a time of the feminist movement. And HRT really gained popularity in the 70s and 80s. Um, we were starting to see some issues arising with blood clots. We started to realize that if you gave estrogen only, so the primarin on its own, some a very small portion of women were getting cancer of the womb, but you could stop that if you give progestion. So things changed. By the 1990s, we were seeing women were happier, there were less heart attacks, they were living longer. So things were going really well by the 1990s. And I remember as a medical student sitting in on well woman clinics, dishing out HRT by the bucket load. But then what went wrong? So here we go. Here are some of the headlines that have just changed the world in terms of HRT. And it was this big media storm, high level media interest from a health scare, as often health scares do. And it came out saying HRT will double your risk of breast cancer. And overnight, 50 percent of women came off their HRT literally straight away. Doctors panicked, they were worried about being sued, and patients were confused, they didn't know what to do. HRT was a bad name. And this has changed the prescribing of HRT worldwide, and we're still being affected by these headlines today. So where did it all come from? Well, the big trial at the time that started in the 90s was the Women's Health Initiative. Um, in the US. So this was a big trial. It was looking at 27,000 women and they were randomized to have either Primarin, so the horse's urine estrogen, plus Provera, which is the progestogen if they had a womb. And the reason they did this trial in the first place is because they wanted to see all these benefits to the heart. Would it help older women as well if they started HRT in older women? 
But what happened was they had to stop the trial within five years because they started to see some bad health outcomes, particularly breast cancer, but also things like strokes and heart attacks, um, which wasn't expected. Now, they did see that women that only had estrogen actually had a reduced risk of breast cancer, but that sort of got swept under the carpet. So there's a big panic at this time. And actually, this data that came out was never properly analysed, and I'll come on to that shortly. But before the data was analysed, someone leaked this to the press. The trial wasn't due to finish till 2004, but this was 2002. And you had epidemiologists who were working on the data and they were challenging the data and trying to figure out what was going on, but it was too late. The headlines had happened and that was it. Now, since then, there's been three big analyses of that data because actually it was a huge study and there's loads of data that we can look at. And we've started to understand where this scare came from. I mean, first of all, the average age of women in this trial was 63. Well, that's way beyond when we would start HRT. The women were aged between 50 and 75, starting HRT at 75. 12% of the women were within 10 years of the menopause. So they, they were after 10 years. This is not standard care. Many of the women, more than half, were overweight. Um, many of the women, because of their age, already had heart problems or had risk factors for heart problems. The Premarin, the estrogen they were using, we know that's a high risk estrogen now. And we know that Provera is not a nice progestogen either. But no one adjusted for all these biases. And normally when you do a study, you have to adjust for what we call confounding factors. But unfortunately, as I said, the, the bad news had come out, that was it. And nobody wanted to hear about it anymore. So, so much data has gone on. And in 2020, there was a joint statement by the British, the European, the Australian, the international menopause societies came together and gave a big statement saying there should be no limit placed on the dose or the duration of HRT. The decision to take HRT should be on an individual basis after a discussion of the risk and benefits. So, what do we know now? How do you weigh up those risks and benefits? So we know that in women with a low risk of breast cancer, which is the general population, the benefits of taking HRT will exceed any harm for the first five years. We know it's beneficial to start HRT within 10 years of menopause or the age 50 to 59. And we know that reduces your risk of heart disease um, and and that is the biggest killer of women. We know where the risk of breast cancer is elevated, that the risk is actually very small, and that most women will not be diagnosed with breast cancer because of their HRT. We know that women who do get breast cancer on HRT are not more likely to die from their breast cancer. So it, HRT is not causing breast cancer deaths. And there's actually an emerging theory now that perhaps HRT doesn't really cause cancer, but what it's doing is speeding up the cancer. So we're picking it up more, um, these kind of indolent tumours that we're picking up quicker. And there was a study, a Danish study in 2012, showing actually if you start HRT early, it reduces your cardiovascular disease, it reduces your death from any cause, and there is no risk of stroke. There was also a reanalysis of the studies in 2021, showing there is no increased risk of blood clots if you take estrogen through the skin. So... This is all dose dependent. Now we know, as I said, if you've had an early menopause, exposure to HRT up to the age of 50, it is not gonna cause you any problems. We are giving you the hormones you already had, and it's very important to do that. The combined HRT, your risk is dose dependent, and it's also affected by the type of HRT. We're now using much more of these modern, um, um, HRTs like Eutrogestan progesterone, which actually doesn't increase your risk of, of breast cancer at all in the first five years. We know that if you don't need progesterone, you only need estrogen, that actually there's no risk of breast cancer. And we know that vaginal estrogen has no risk at all. So really, the, you have to put this risk of breast cancer in perspective to understand what the risk is. 
So breast cancer is the most common cancer in developed countries. And looking at the UK, one in seven women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. But survival's drastically improved and 90% of women will survive their breast cancer. Age is the biggest risk of breast cancer. A quarter of women who get breast cancer are over 75. And the peak of the diagnosis is actually in the 90s. And there are other risk factors. Um, such as lifestyle that have more of a risk than HRT. This is my favourite slide of the whole talk. And if there's one image I want imprinted on your minds when you're thinking about HRT, it's this image. So this helps put the risk in perspective. So I can tell you that in the background population in the UK, if you took a thousand women between the age of 50 and 59, 23 will get breast cancer in five years. If all those thousand women were on HRT, the combined HRT, there would be an additional four women will get breast cancer. If they only took estrogen and not the progestogen, there'll be four less women get breast cancer. If you've ever taken the contraceptive pill, there would be four additional cases, which this is interesting, isn't it? So the risk of the pill is the same as HRT, yet we prescribe the pill by bucket loads all around the world. Now, if you drink two or more units of alcohol a day, and that's really a large glass of wine, your risk of breast cancer is five extra cases. That's higher than the risk of HRT. If you smoke, it's an extra three. But if you look here, the risk, if you're overweight or obese, a BMI over 30, it's an additional 24 women. That's more than double the risk. And yet we're not seeing headlines about obesity causing breast cancer. If you exercise for at least two and a half hours a week at a moderate intensity, there are seven less women who have breast cancer. And actually, some menopause specialists can argue that if we put women on HRT, they're more likely to lose weight. They're more likely to exercise. They might not need to drink that glass of wine every day because they feel better. And they could actually have a lower risk of um, breast cancer. And there's a lot of research going to go on into this. So that's a lot of information I'm aware, but the conclusions on HRT and breast cancer are this. We know there is a link between HRT and breast cancer. We know this link is very small. We know certain types of HRT are more risky and we tend to now prescribe the safer types. We should always consider risk in context of your individual risk factors when making a decision. We know that any slight increased risk of breast cancer with HRT is less than the risk with other lifestyle factors such as alcohol and obesity. We know the risk is related to how long you use it and for micronized progestogen there is no risk in the first five years. And we know that this risk actually declines. There's a good study, um, the million, million Women study, that showed that the risk five years after stopping HRT actually goes. There are other risks that you have to be careful about. So a slight increased risk of blood clots. And I say slight, it's 1.7 women per thousand. So um, same as uh, the contraceptive pill, we always counsel about blood clots. Heart disease, remember it protects your heart if you start it in the first 10 years. But if we start it late, yes, we did see in that trial, it can increase the risk of heart disease. Stroke can be increased. It's a very slight increased risk. Um, but only with oral HRT. We don't see the increase with the HRT in the skin. And ovarian cancer, this is still being debated, but potentially one extra case per thousand, which equates to a 0.1% rise in your risk of cancer, a 0.6% rise of dying of ovarian cancer. These are sort of things that your doctor will go through to make sure if it's safe to have HRT. So we always check there's no hormone dependent cancer or symptoms of that, any history of blood clots, liver disease, heart disease, fibroids. You can still have HRT if you've got fibroids, but we have to think about how we're going to give it to you. Same with endometriosis. It should not be a closed door. You should be able to discuss how we're going to give it to you. Again, high blood pressure, your GP should not say no. As long as we manage your blood pressure, you can have HRT. And migraine, you can have HRT, but have it through the skin. Um, and actually, it's probably going to make your migraines better. So you've read all the information. Where next? So what are you going to take? 
first question is, do you have a womb? Because if you don't have a womb, all you need is oestrogen. But if you do have a womb, we know we have to give you some additional progesterone to protect the lining. And if you're in the first one to two years um, of your perimenopause, we generally give you what we call a sequential. So we give you periods. Or if you've been postmenopausal for a while, we don't want to give you periods. We give you a continuous regime. And you can get um, estrogens for the vagina too. So it can come in tablets, gels, creams. The progesterone could be given in a coil. It could also be a capsule or vaginal tablets. And then we do have Tibolone, which is a tablet, which is not that common anymore. Um, it can be useful for endometriosis. You might wonder how long you're going to take it. Well, really, as I said earlier, it's down to the individual woman's choice um, on how long you would take it. Um, but we're always monitoring for any risk factors. And what we normally do is review you between one to three months later, and then every year. And when we review you, we're checking again your breast screening up to date, what is your risk of osteoporosis, and looking at your heart health. There are side effects with HRT. So estrogen side effects can be breast tenderness, leg cramps, nausea, bloating, headaches, a bit like starting the pill. It generally is pretty well tolerated, the estrogen. Progestogen can cause side effects. I think if you're getting side effects, it's more likely the progestogen that's doing it. So sometimes we do look at that. And, and this can be, again, headaches, breast tenderness, mood swings, PMT, because it's progestogen, a bit like before your period, your progestogen dominant. So these are the sort of symptoms. But there are things we can do. We can change the dose, the type of progestogen. We can change how we give it to you. We can change how long in the cycle you take it. So a lot of women give up after their first try of HRT because of side effects. My message is don't. Just speak to a doctor and, and a doctor that understands and, and they can change things for you. I'll just quickly touch on bioidentical HRT. I do get asked about this and often people, they've tried um, everything they can over the counter, they're desperate and they might turn to these companies that are now proliferating around the world, often online, and they do what we call compounding. So they make up their own creams or lozenges or vaginal preparations. It's, you've got to remember, this is still HRT, it's still hormones, but it's not regulated as a conventional product. It hasn't had the same rigorous drug development. And if they start offering you expensive saliva tests and serum tests, then you must uh, back away from that. But what women don't realize is, well, we have body identical HRT, which is regulated medication and is safer to take um, and is like our own hormones. And this would be micronized progestogen and usually estradiol 17 beta in a gel. And we have both of these in Singapore and they're generally better tolerated. You can have it if you're at risk of blood clot. There's a less chance of breast cancer and it has a better effect on your um, cholesterol than all these older types. And I would argue most women really should be starting on these now. I'll just touch on the genitourinary symptom of menopause, which is the new name for vulvovaginal atrophy. They thought the name atrophy was a bit kind of withered, so decided to change the name. And this really is more than just a bit of vaginal dryness. This can be burning, stinging. You can't exercise. You can't ride a bike. You can't have sex without pain or bleeding. You can't put on a swimming costume. It can affect your bladder. You can have multiple urine infections or urine frequency or incontinence. This can be quite distressing, actually. 80% of women will get it. 8% will see their doctor. But there are effective treatments. There's topical estrogens in creams or a pessary of a tablet that work very well. There's no risk at all with those. You don't need to use progestogen with it. You can use it alongside your HRT if you're already on that. And also good lubricants. And I don't mean sort of strawberry flavored with glitter in it. I mean a natural uh, proper lubricant. And also vaginal moisturizers are very good. And these um, are used once every three days um, and they can really help with um, vaginal moisture. And what about testosterone? I do get asked about this a lot. Yes, there's definitely a role for testosterone. Remember that 50% of testosterone is produced by your ovaries, so it can decline. 
And testosterone is needed for your sex drive, for your energy levels, for your bones and your brain, actually. Often that brain fog can improve with testosterone. So what we do first is give you HRT because that might solve it. That might actually help your sex drive and your energy. But if that's not enough, some women, we then check your testosterone levels and then we may prescribe you some testosterone. But there is no licensed testosterone here in Singapore. In fact, only Australia has a licensed testosterone. So we use very small quantities of a male testosterone and we monitor your levels. And generally, it's pretty well tolerated. What about sex and menopause? Well, yes, women are still having sex after the menopause. 66% of women between the age of 45 and 50 and 48% of women between 60 and 74 are having satisfying sexual relationships that are important to their quality of life. But the menopause can be a challenge for sex because often with this vaginal dryness or before you're feeling low, um, it can have an impact on your relationship. Um, it's good then to think about HRT for your libido or you might want to consider testosterone. Um, treat your genitourinary symptoms of menopause. I mean, it can be quite isolating in a relationship if you're refusing sex because it hurts. And often when you're menopausal, you might go into yourself and you might not talk to your partner about what's really going on. The next thing is you're not having cuddles because that could lead to something and they feel rejected. Um, they think you're having an affair. And actually, the divorce rate is the highest around the perimenopausal time. So, you know, this is important. Prioritise it. Only 8% of women come and see us, but do come and have a chat with us. We've seen it all before. Look after your pelvic floor, as always, um, and menopause and relationships. Yes, we've just talked about with husbands. It can also be with friends, actually, and um, with children. You can be more irritable. It does have an impact on many relationships. Do I need contraception? Yes, you do, is my big message. And women often forget this. And there's a slight uptick in unplanned pregnancies at the menopause. Um, but you've got lots of options. Now, the general rule is if you are under 50 and your periods have stopped, you need contraception for two more years. If you are over the age of 50, you only need contraception for one more year. But you have options. The pill you can use until 50, that's the combined pill, and it does help with your bone density and it will help with your menopausal symptoms. The progesterone only pill, the mini pill, is a bit safer because it doesn't have the heart risks, um, the breast cancer risk that the pill does, or the blood clot risk, and you can take that to 55. Um, the depot injection is very good until 50. We get a little bit twitchy because if you have it too long, it can affect your bone density, but some women it's great. The implant is a hair grip sized implant that we fit under the arm every three years. And again, it's very safe, a low dose hormone. You can have that 50. The Mirena coil, which is the coil with the hormone or the cock coil, you can just continue until you're 55. And I would just say the Mirena coil is an excellent choice because it gives you contraception. It protects your lining of the womb. It gives you your progestogen that you need to protect the womb. And then all you do is take some estrogen gel on top and that's it. Um, so a very good option, particularly if you're suffering with heavy periods around the perimenopause. Work and lifestyle. So more women than ever are in the workplace. More women are working later. At this point in your life, you are a big asset to your company. You're knowledgeable. You're probably at the peak of your career. And yet the menopause can completely floor you at this point. And some women have to seek early retirement. And it's such a shame. It's a shame for the woman. It's a shame for society. So have a look at this. One in 10 women have considered giving up work due to menopause symptoms. Women generally report less job satisfaction, lower levels of commitment, and it can impact on performance. I mean, there's no doubt, is there, if you're tired, you can't remember your login for the computer, you have a sudden hot flush in the middle of a meeting. I mean, it does have a big impact. So talk to your employer. I mean, actually, most women would rather have a sick note saying anxiety than the menopause, God forbid. But see if you can talk to your employer, see if they're sympathetic to understand what's going on. 
a large proportion of women do take time off due to menopausal symptoms. Check the temperature, the ventilation. Flexible working is a good idea. And actually with COVID, that's a little bit more easier for many of you. Get an emotional support network. So there might be another woman who's going through this too. And, and having that chat with them, opening up can be a really good idea. Keep notes, plan your day, do your big tasks first thing in the morning. Um, put the string again, it's going to mess it up. Oh, um, and consider a three minute stress buster. And by that, I mean popping out at lunchtime, get some fresh air, um, and obviously, if you consider HRT and we actually treat your symptoms, then you don't really need to do any of this, but that's your decision to have. So, talking to your GP. The role of your doctor is to provide you with accurate information to allow you to make an informed choice, because that is what individualised care is all about, isn't it? But sometimes women describe seeing their GP as going to battle. And I've certainly had women come into clinic with tears in their eyes, and I can feel they're really trying to pitch me for the HRT. Well, they're knocking on the right door that day, aren't they? But it is a sad state of affairs when you think that as GPs, we don't have any formal training in the menopause, actually, and that we have... You're muted. Okay, Dr. Daly, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I was just saying how to get the most out of your GP. So the first thing would be to do your homework. Um, find a GP with a specialist interest in women's health. We are generalists, but we all have our own interests. Um, so finding someone who has a good interest in women's health um, will be beneficial for you. Write down all your symptoms and you can find questionnaires online um, that you could fill out and take with you to the appointment. They're really useful for you and for the doctor. Really consider what is your main concern and expectation. So it could be that you're worried more about your mental health consequences of the menopause. It could be more about your painful sex, or it could be you want to understand if it's safe for you to take HRT. So be open and honest with your GP about what it is you really want to talk about. Take a friend if it helps for support. And I would say be prepared to wait for any answers. If your GP needs to contact a specialist or get some extra information, you might need to come back for a follow-up visit and you might need a longer appointment. So we will just come back to the menopause quiz. Um, so you know it's the menopause when you have hot flushes. So I wonder how you answered before. Well, as you know, three in four women will have hot flushes. But if you're waiting for a hot flush to see your GP, you could be waiting a long time if you're the quarter that doesn't. HRT is the leading cause of breast cancer. No, it's not. We know age is the biggest cause. And then after that, it's more obesity uh, causing breast cancer. Antidepressants should be used, used first line for women with anxiety or depression. No, if it's due to your menopause, you need oestrogen. The menopause only lasts one to two years, so put up with it. The menopause can last over 12 years for 10% of women. And this idea of putting up with it is really outdated now. Weight gain is inevitable. It's not inevitable. I think that's a strong word, but it is more difficult, I'm afraid. Um, it's more challenging to keep the pounds off at this stage in your life, but there are things you can do. Your sex life is over after the menopause. No, it's definitely not over. Many women enjoy a very fulfilling sex life, but you might have to take some steps um, to help you, particularly if you're getting lots of vaginal dryness. So my take home messages. This is a natural process, but it can significantly affect your mental and physical well-being. HRT is effective, it reduces symptoms, helps quality of life, but the risks have been overestimated. You need to make a fully informed decision 
weighing up the pros and cons. And when you consider starting HRT, you've got to question which one, how you're going to have it, how long, and this is all tailored to you. Because women need to feel in control, supported, listened to. They want a meaning, positive life after the menopause. You're gonna be in this state for a third of your life. But let's face it, life can be hard. We've got COVID right now, but if we manage your menopause, balance your hormones, it will help you balance your life. And what's more is we can reduce your long-term risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, dementia. And maybe then we could start to embrace the menopause as a positive time in our life where we don't have to worry about periods and pregnancy, our nurturing of children is over, we can focus on ourselves, our careers, um, but we need to open this conversation with, with our family and our friends and keep the conversation going. So I know that's a lot of information. Thank you all for listening. I hope it was informative. Any questions, please? It was very informative, Dr. Daly. Um, do you want to stop sharing so we can see your, your very beautiful face? There we go. Okay, here we go. Actually, you know what? You've answered every single question during the presentation um, that popped on the chat. But uh, one question was about um, the coil or the mirena. So if you have mirena mm. already, and um, would that sort of, uh, you know, would that show, not show all the symptoms as much mm. when the menopause comes? Would it, would it kind of like, yeah. you know, it's a really good question and we see this a lot so if you're on contraception yes you might not be seeing your periods changing so it's hard to know I mean, first of all do you still need contraception maybe you're not fertile anymore we can do a blood test we, that's when we can do the fsh test and sometimes we do um, to see if it's raised but we have to do it twice um, and then if it's raised then we make a decision on how long you need it it will mask the period changing but it won't affect the other symptoms so you will still get the flushes the mood change the vaginal dryness because that's the estrogen so it's estrogen that you need where all the mirena is is the progestogen but actually as i said it's fantastic the mirena after 45 you can leave it till 55 you don't need another one after five years you leave it oh. the whole way through um, unless you want estrogen with it then you can only have it for five years um, a great option around that time of your life. Okay, that's good to know. Um, back to HRT. So one is asking, when do you know to start HRT? Do you only start when your symptom starts? You start when you think you need it. I think that's the key thing. If your symptoms are debilitating, they're affecting your quality of life, um, then you start it and we would go through all the pros and cons and, and the decision um, whether you need to take it or not. So it's very individual. Um, you might come and see me and say, well, I get the occasional hot flush, but it's okay. I'm, it's not waking me up at night. I, I'm okay, actually, I'm managing it. Okay, well, let's see how you go. You don't want to have HRT. Or you might come in and say, my goodness, I can't live like this anymore, help me, you know? And then we say, it's time that you need to. And that doesn't matter whether your periods have ended or not. Um, you should not be waiting. A lot of women wait for these periods to stop. They think that's when you see your doctor and it's not the case. Okay, that's a good the one um there is one question here from joe my gp did hormone blood tests and because they were normal has dismissed hrt even though i'm having primenopausal symptoms for two years they're getting much worse how should she approach this should she get a second opinion okay oh it's like we're banging our head against the wall sometimes and you know that knowledge isn't getting to doctors as much as patients but we can if you're over 45 and she has symptoms you can't rely on the FSH. And actually, even if you're under 45, if we think this is an early menopause, what's the harm in giving someone HRT for three months? We'll know if you're better, we'll know what it is, what the diagnosis is. But there is this fear with doctors. What they'll do is a blood test and say, no, it's not the menopause and on you, see you on your way and come back in a year. 
And that lady has to live a year with sometimes quite distressing symptoms until she's allowed to have another blood test. So no, what you can do is go back to your GP and quote the NICE guidelines and, or ask them to read the NICE guidelines or any of the International Menopausal Society guidelines um, because it's a worldwide consensus over 45, you should not really be doing a blood test. Okay, fantastic. Well, Dr. Daly, it's 11.16, and I know that you have patients to see yes. in your clinic today. Um, but guess what? I, I am going to download all the questions, and I'm going to send it over to you guys so you can actually answer them. Right. And for those who joined us today, thank you very much for spending your morning with us and um, Dr. Daly from IMC. Uh, this has been really interesting and very, very helpful. And if you look at the chat, everyone is saying you are brilliant. And thank you for all the information you've given us today. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I'm just really pleased to be able to do this. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a fantastic Friday. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the rules is opening up next week. So hopefully we can see everyone uh, in groups of five. Um, so take care, everyone. Take care of yourselves. And thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Take care. Everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.